Well, we're in a series uh, focusing on the book of Acts. Um, And if you haven't been here uh, before in the last six weeks now, um, it's been, we're looking at this idea of new beginnings. Uh, Maybe something has changed for you recently, uh, whether that be uh, maybe in addition to the family. Uh, That's what it's been for us and uh, Hannah coming into the world. And so we've been super thankful for that. And um, but but I don't know. We're all in different places. Sometimes um, an illness shows up or comes, and and we have to uh, wrestle with God's goodness in the midst of that difficulty. And I feel like that's happening a lot right now for us. And so as we pray for each other, I just want us to remember that that a new beginning doesn't always uh, mean um, that we're going to have uh, health and and money and those things. And that's not necessarily what we're about or what God's about. He's about helping us walk through the struggle. Um, and if you were in Adults Bible Study Day, we talked about that in James. And so today, we're going to be moving forward in the book of Acts. We're going to be in uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 36 through 41. So you can go ahead and turn there. And um, the thing that I just want us to focus on is uh, what might be the most important thing or things to you in all the world. And with that, there's going to be um, just this idea um, as we're moving forward. Um, in the slides, you'll see this, uh, but uh, what we're going to talk about is available to all available to everyone, and it should be the most important thing in our lives. Uh, but sometimes we put other things there, and, and I think there's uh, areas where even uh, we, we don't mean to do that. Um, things creep in, and they replace uh, God, or they become in the place of Him. And sometimes we just need to take that evaluation to see what those are. And so just in the weeks in review, I know in the last couple of weeks we've been kind of doing this mini-series within the series that we're in, New Beginnings in Acts. Uh, And uh, Peter has brought a message, and he's looked at a couple of different things for us, just really kind of foundational ideas for us. So as we uh, walk through this, I just want to remind you, a couple weeks ago um, we talked about um, Jesus coming, that he saved us, and he stays always with us. So basically it's the eternal security of the believer, that we have that, um, that that unlike even other Protestant denominations, uh, we come into this place and we hear the gospel and we respond to it, And there's nothing that anybody can do to take that away from us. So then uh, next week, which will be last week, we had uh, our great rally celebration. We talked about um, this idea of Jesus being timeless. So it's really, really important. If you look at anything in the Bible, um, if you think that that God changes in any way throughout um, history or the Bible, um, we've got to kind of turn that on its head and say, no, God doesn't change. We just change, right? We experience things and... And sometimes we kind of, we put God in that place of, well, something's changed for me, so what happened with you? You know, God thought we were good, right? And so now today, I I just want to move us into a place where we ask ourselves, what are the most important things in our lives? And sometimes it takes uh, an event that happens in your life, whether that be uh, maybe the loss of somebody close to you, maybe an illness yourself, or maybe even something that would be positive, maybe a, a change in job or a promotion, something like that, and then you, it comes to your mind, what are the most important things in life? And uh, today, um, it's a, a day that's heavy on my mind and heart because it's uh, uh, 20 years ago, this day, um, there was a shooting at my church, and I know I've shared that story before, my testimony, that's a big part of that. Uh, and just just to be able to walk through this, it's one of those events in my life, because I, I want you to go back and think about those things, because they're not the same for everybody. Um, I remember that being a time where I had made a profession of faith a few years before, and then a man walked into my church and he shot 14 people in, during a service for students. And, and so at that point, I had to just say, God, what are the most important things in my life? Is it really you? Is it really um, what you're doing right now? Or, or are they other things? And I think we might be shocked even when we start asking ourselves those questions. What are the things that pop into our minds are the most important? Now, they might be, well... My kids are really important. That's not a bad thing. You know, our children are important to us. Uh, but other things might pop in there like, well, you know, I, I, and I've been checking my 401k and it's not doing so well right now. That's pretty important to me. And uh, maybe my house, the value's gone up or it's gone down. That's pretty important to me. Uh, but at the end of the day, God wants us to bring us to this place where, where Peter's going to continue to bring us and he's going to say, here's what's most important to me. Remind you about it. Okay, and that's what we're going to be walking through this morning. So let's jump into the text, Acts 2, 36-41. Hopefully you're already there. Uh, we'll read through it, but it should be on the screens for you. Verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said this to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, 
And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. 40. And with many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So if you don't know uh, the background, again, the book of Acts, uh, written by a guy named Luke. He was a disciple and now an apostle in this situation, writing from uh, his own firsthand experience and also other people's firsthand accounts of what took place when the church started and it exploded. It was about a 30-year period that this took place, and it was not just for, uh, for us to have an, a historical account of what took place, although that's good for us to have, and it's good that that's in God's Word, but an account of how the power of God through the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, gave these people the ability to do things that they had never even dreamed of. And you look at the example of Peter, the one who's sharing this right now, someone who denied Jesus when he was going to the cross, and you turn around and he's one of the central figures in the New Testament church. You think, wow, well, if there's hope for Peter, there's hope for us, right? So let's keep going. I just want you to remember this again, uh, the most important thing. So what are those in your life? And then as we're looking through this, we're going to see that the most important things are the most important thing being God himself is going to be available to all people, okay? And so here in the first couple of verses, verses 36 and 37, um, this is going to be the first fill in the blank, so you'll see this up on the screens. The most important question. Um, I think that's the place where all of us need to come. We need to come to a point where we say, really, what is the most important? What is the most important question to ask? might not be the same in everyone's minds, but here's what Peter said. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, anytime Peter's in front of a group of people, there's going to be a group that are uh, going to receive the gospel, or they're going to hear it, and they're going to respond, and that's going to be positive for them, and they're going to be excited. And there's going to be this other group, a religious group, uh, mostly centralized around uh, the Jews and the priests, and, and they are upset. Okay, because they um, uh, were part of sending Jesus to the cross, and they thought if we can get rid of this guy who they didn't believe was the Son of God, then it will fix everything. And that actually did the opposite, because he was the Son of God, and he did exactly what he said he was going to do, and he saved us. And, and so we get to this point where Peter's continually telling everybody, not because he just enjoys making people angry. I don't think that's, that's what his goal was, obviously. But he's telling people, hey, here's the truth. Here's who Jesus is. And God made him both Lord and Christ. And so you got this group over here getting really angry, seething. You got this other group going, this is the best thing we've ever heard. Okay? All right? And that's the world too. We share the words and we, I think we expect maybe um, we share the gospel with people just to, wow, you know, yeah, I want to be saved right now. And that's not always what happens, right? And so for us, it's an encouragement because there was a lot of opposition. We're going to see that. Peter's going to go through a lot more difficult things than this and just people being upset. They're going to end up throwing him in jail. We're going to see that in weeks to come and, and beat him up and say, stop saying what you're saying. And he's going to keep saying this. Well, how can I help but say the truth, the words of life, what God has given me, what we've seen with our own eyes. And then verse 37 says they were cut to the heart. Well, why? Because they realized their need for Jesus Christ. Hey, have you ever been talking with anybody or... Um, maybe meeting with anybody or sharing with somebody and, and you can tell there's been a cut to the heart. I, I remember just the times in my life that that's happened and, and specifically back to when I put my faith and trust in Jesus and I was driving down the road. Well, I wasn't. I was a kid. Uh, my dad was driving down the road and I was sitting next to him in the passenger seat uh, and uh, we were going to a funeral and so uh, that puts things in perspective for you. Funerals normally do. Uh, and we were dri just driving down the road, and um, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to ask some questions. So I was asking questions to my dad. I said, God, I know this is the truth. I know what the Bible says. And um, I said, is this really, I mean, is this really what God said? Is this really the case that if I put my faith and my trust in what Jesus has done for me, then I'll be saved, and I'll have eternal life, and I'll be with him forever in heaven? And um, at that moment, my dad was sharing with me um, in, in no other way that I ex experienced before because I, had already, I already knew the information uh, but I was a skeptic, and so I just kept asking questions. But at that moment, the Holy Spirit illuminated that truth to me, and, and I was a believer, and I became a believer. And I think there's other times in our lives that that happens. We're cut to the heart. Maybe it's a, um, a wedding, you know, a wedding of uh, a child or somebody you know who's close to you, maybe your own. And that happens, I know it's happened for most of us in the room. And um, as you look forward to that, there's a lot of those different type of life events that take place. Um, and I, I've been blessed in a number of ways because I have three 
beautiful women in my life uh, that are uh, very close to me, my wife and two daughters. And, and one of the things that God has done, because I'm very uh, matter of fact, I'm very kind of you know, detail oriented, just I've got the, you know, the facts and it's kind of what I work off of most of the time. Uh, but when it comes to the things, uh, feeling what's going on around me and the people that are here and, uh, and that we're invested with in the church, uh, my wife, who's uh, got the wonderful gift of mercy and, and discernment and empathy, um, I remember we just have conversations uh, with people and, and sometimes she'll just start tearing up and saying, what's going on? It's like, do you not feel like what they're feeling? It's like, no, no I don't always feel that, right? Because we're not gifted in the same way. And then I think, wow, what an awesome gift that... And sometimes for me it's overwhelming because I don't always understand it, right? How, how God allows certain people to be cut to the heart in different ways and some people to be able to understand those things for everybody. Um, it's different, right? Or maybe with a, a child, Hannah doesn't talk yet. She says some things, but we can't understand what she's saying. She smiles a lot, so that's cool. That cuts me to the heart, right? Uh, but Alana, I know she says this all the time. I mean, every morning we get up, we're going to bed. Um, Daddy, I want you. Daddy, I want you, right? And that's... Uh, just some of the some of the best words that I could ever hear any day. It doesn't really matter what's going on, but if I hear those, uh, it cuts me to the heart, right? And so I think in the same way, uh, God does that for us in a variety of ways, and He's trying to soften us up. But but the truth is, if we're not willing to hear those things, if we're not willing to receive the direction that God's pointing us, uh, that we're just not going to be growing, okay? And so here's what um, David says in Psalm 119. He's going to compare a couple of different people, right? So a man after God's own heart is going to share this with us in Psalm 119. It's verse 70 through 72. Um, it's one of my favorite sections um, in the Old Testament that David shares, Psalm 119, 70 through 72. It says this, Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So church, how can we be cut to the heart if we don't have that soft heart, if we're not looking for the things of God on a regular basis? And many times, I think we don't see those things. Maybe it's because we're being pulled in one direction or the other because something else is more important to us. So here's the question, and it's the most important question, and, and here's what he's going to ask, and I'll read it for you again. Um, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So having heard the gospel message, they want to respond, and they say, what shall we do? Well, it's a good thing we're not ending there today, because we're going to move to verse 38 and 39. We're going to see what he's going to say. And this next fill in the blank uh, is just uh, the most important promise, okay? And the girls sang about that this morning, and that was, uh, that was awesome. And we've got this promise that, uh, that really anybody outside of Christianity, those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, they don't have that promise, right? We sing about that, and we celebrate that, but there's so many people that don't. And so here's what he says again in verse 38. This is the response. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in verse 38, there's a lot of things going on. Um, and, and even uh, in different denominations and different uh, faiths, we'll take this text, we'll sometimes say, Well, you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You have to repent. Um, and then you've got to be baptized also, and then you've got to follow these series of rules and regulations, and, uh, and, then, and then maybe then you'll be saved. But we're not sure. And so you, you might hear some of those things, but what Peter is saying here, here's the most important thing. Here's the most important promise, and it starts with repentance, right? So every single one of you, I know when I was in that car, my dad uh, pulled off on the side of the road. I understood my need for God. I said, God, I, I, and I know I'm a sinner, and I'm hopeless, and I'm... Uh, I, I can't do anything without you. And so here's just some definitions, some thoughts for us. Uh, the putting your faith and trust in Jesus and turning from sin actively, right? And we know that's happened in our lives. If we've trusted in Jesus, we've turned from that. And in the Greek, there's this word for repentance, the uh, metaneo. And basically what that means is just to um, change one's mind, so change our minds, our hearts, heartily to amend with the abhorrence of one's sin. So it's basically just saying, I know exactly what I've been doing up until this point. I've been not following God. I've been turning away from Him. I've been doing things my own way. And here's what I want to do. I'm not going to be perfect ever. Certainly, I know that. But God has given me the opportunity to trust in Him and put my faith in Him. And that's what really justifies us before God, and we know that. And so here in Mark 1.15, it's used again. Uh, and this is what it says. 
The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, see, we can't, we can't lump, I think, uh, what's happening in these verses together because Peter's trying to summarize for the believers, here's what you need to do in response. And the first thing is repentance. You need to understand your need for God and put your faith and your trust in Him. And then we get to baptism. Um, we're Baptists, so we should know, you know what that's about and what that means. But I just want to go over it again for us. Um, it's basically just a symbolic expression uh, of our inward faith decision. So um, I, I don't know if you've seen anybody been baptized before. And we got to baptize uh, Gia a couple weeks ago in a creek. So Mike, thank you for the opportunity uh, in that, uh, that little creek there. Uh, I was trying to prepare for the water temperature, but I don't know that I fully did that. Uh, by July, it's supposed to be warm, uh, but uh, yeah, not so much. So, uh, but I'm glad we got to do that. And if you look at the, the Greek here, the word uh, baptizo, it really means to be fully immersed under the water um, at different, uh, in different denominations and even different faiths. And um, you, you might uh, see that people will say, well, we're going we're gonna to sprinkle the baby so that we know that they're good or that they're saved. And, and the text doesn't necessarily indicate that. So what it says is that we're supposed to be fully immersed. So as an adult, we're making a decision or even a, even a kid can make the decision and say, you know, uh, I remember we were um, sitting in our living room, you know, Mike and Lauren and, and Gia, and she said, yeah, I've made that decision and I want to get baptized. And they're like, yeah, she can't stop talking about it, right? And that's, I mean, that's the right perspective, right? And then Mike says, okay, we got a creek, let's do it tomorrow. Oh, okay, all right, sure, let's, let's do it tomorrow, right? But you find this uh, word 77 times in the Greek New Testament, and it's important to us, um, I think, for a number of reasons. And Jesus didn't just leave it at, you know what, I want you to repent, put your faith and trust in me, and then uh, get baptized, because I said so, right? You know, moms and dads in here, um, I've even caught myself doing this. You know, Alana, you know, do this, I need you to do this right now. Oh, well, you know. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, we'll do it. You know, I said to do it, so just do it, right? And so we don't really feel like giving you know, information or reason why or maybe even being an example, but here's what God's Word says in Matthew 3, 13. Jesus was actually the example for us. He didn't have to do this. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. <laughs> do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus himself was baptized, right? So we see that it's another just affirmation for us and that it really is important for us to make a distinction on what we believe. So Jesus was baptized, the full immersion in the water. He was the example for us. I mean, then Jesus said to also, right? So it's, it's, he was the example and he said in Matthew 20, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. And so that's what he says to us. He's given us uh, instructions, right? Marching orders. He said, hey, I, I did all this. I was the example, and now I want you to go, and I want you to do this yourself. If you need a little bit of a further explanation for this, you'll find this in Romans. Uh, Paul talks about this sporadically, but specifically in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, um, it's this symbolic expression. So here's what it says. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. And maybe you've heard that. When somebody comes up out of the water, we say, she might walk in a newness of life. This is what Paul says in Romans 6 about what Jesus already did and what he said that we should do in receiving believers' baptism, but that it comes after salvation, repentance. Okay? And then uh, the Holy Spirit here. Peter references this also. The, the order's kind of interesting, but I just want us to understand that through salvation, repentance, we receive the Holy Spirit. And because some people have asked me this before, um, especially kids, teenagers I've worked a lot with, and, and they'll make a decision, but they will have not been baptized, even for you know, years at a time. And, and they're very worried. They say, you know, Michael, is something going to happen to me? I was like, I don't really know what you mean. Like, <laughs> you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Well, yeah, but I haven't gotten baptized. I'm like, well, why? Ah, I just haven't had time. And so, like, you know, does what really saves you. The truth is that putting your faith and trust in Jesus is what saves you. But baptism is a command, okay? And so what, what I'm not saying, what you're not going to hear me say is that uh, we should not do that or we should not care about it, right? Um, we should. It's a command in God's Word. And so when we uh, look at it, we should go, yes, that's right. We should do it as soon as we possibly can. Now, 
Um, if you're in the room and you're thinking that, and that's not necessarily the background I've come from, not Baptist, or maybe just different things have gone on for you and I haven't done that, that's okay. God's just saying, hey, I'm here whenever you're ready. I'd love for you to do that, to participate in baptism and the symbolic expression of your inward faith decision. So then we get to the Holy Spirit. Um, in the Greek, kind of a strange word, uh, the hagios pneuma, uh, and you'll see this uh, just over and over again in the New Testament, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, uh, part of the Trinity. Um, and, and I just want to kind of go over what takes place, okay? So at the point that we put our faith and trust in Jesus, repentance happens, the Holy Spirit comes and He dwells inside of us, okay? So we have that guiding uh, direction from God Himself that lives inside of us, and, and He's with us always. So here's what Romans 8, 9 says, uh, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Now, the question is, how does this play taste? Well, take place? Well, God causes it, right? We put our faith and trust in Him, and He causes the Spirit to dwell inside of us. And, and just like that picture we got to see several weeks ago, the Lion King, although it's silly, um, Simba didn't get it until he saw his father's reflection in the water, right? And so just in the same way, we have to understand that God is dwelling inside of us. <clears throat> We, came, we come from the place, and I know reading through the book of Genesis, it's a reminder for us, because we, we read God created everything, and it was so great, and, and Adam and Eve together, and, 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 and there was man, and, he, and God made this perfect help for, her, for him, and it was woman, and then everything was great, and then sent into the picture, and it messed everything up. <clears throat> and so for us, I think our perspective just needs to be that God is trying to move us back to this place of perfect communion with him, and that's not ever going to be perfect while we're here in this life. We know that. But what God has done for us in giving us Jesus Christ and in giving us the Holy Spirit is the, the closest thing that we will have this side of eternity. And so I want to just keep our focus there because if we, if we sort of go, oh, Holy Spirit, it's not a big deal. Um, uh, maybe He dwells inside of us. Is that good or bad? I don't really know. It doesn't really matter to me. I mean, to have Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And that should change our life. That should inform everything else that we do. And then verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, everyone from the Lord our God calls to himself. So who is the promise for? Everyone. It's available to everyone, right? I think um, sometimes we get that feeling. We even think to ourselves, well, God, when I, when I get things right, when I get things cleaned up enough, um, then I can come before you, and I will be worthy of your salvation. Uh, but the truth is that, like we talked about last week, there's nothing that we could ever do to merit salvation. We can't come to God and offer something of ourselves or a good enough lifestyle or, or anything to merit that. And so in verse 39, he just, again, wants to emphasize for us, as Peter did at the very beginning, he said, salvation's for everybody. And God doesn't discriminate. He doesn't say, unless you are this way, then I want you on the team, right? We always get that kind of picture of like the A, the B, the C team, and then the guys are just like, you know, hanging out there, the water boys, whatever, different strings. And God says, well, I need those A team guys. Well, look, he's saying, look, it doesn't matter where you come from or what you've done, I want you on my team, no matter who you are, no matter how good you think things are going or how good you think you're doing, okay? And then here's the last thing. We'll close on this. Chapter 2, verses 40 through 41. The most important word. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Um, and when, when you first see this, save yourselves from this crooked generation, um, Peter's actually referencing something uh, back in the Old Testament. And so I love this because he's constantly tying the Old Testament to what's going to take place in the New Testament. And for us now, we get to read it all together. Um, it's just really awesome. So this is uh, out of Deuteronomy 32.5. Uh, it says this, They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children, because they are blemished. They are crooked and twisted generation. And this was the people of God. They had just continually said, We know what the truth is, but we're going to choose to do something else. We know who God is, but we're going to worship these idols over here. And Peter, in the same way, he said, Hey, look, there's always going to be this crooked and twisted generation. I, I think we like to think that that maybe we're better than the generation that came before. Or we always think, you know, when I was growing up, things weren't like that. But the truth is that each generation that comes after, 
there's always something that's different. Always something that maybe seems a little more messed up, but it's just messed up in a different way, right? And in the same way, Peter says, look, no matter what, what Deuteronomy 32, 5 says, and it's going to stay with us always, you need to save yourselves from this crooked generation. And he's using the Old Testament, but he's speaking in what's going to be the New Testament for us. And really, this, it's, it's up there, the most important word. We know the most important word is God's word, right? And we understand salvation, what that is, what he's given us. We understand that question that Peter asked or that the, that the people who were there asked, and he answered that question for them. And now we get to this place where he, he's basically just telling them, hey, look, here's the most important thing. I'm going to share with you more, but let me point you back to the Old Testament and say, hey, you, you need to be really about saving yourselves from this crooked generation. He was really just talking about the things that were going on that were not of God. The people of the Old Testament, and they knew what he was referencing. They just constantly were saying, we know what the truth is, but we're going to choose to do something different. And I think you may be here today and you, you think to yourself, uh, well, you know, I mean, I'm a believer. I mean, I follow God, but, but in reality, when we ask that question at the very beginning, what are the most important things to you? Who is the most important uh, my guess is that maybe some things popped into your mind and maybe some of those things scared you. And I don't know what they are for you individually, but I, I think we really have got to be about <laughs> what the Bible is always about, which is why it's great. Um, self-examination is key, right? And we look at his word, the most important words. They're always going to do that for us. They're always going to do what Peter says. They're going to cut us to the heart. And sometimes when that happens, we, we kind of we pull back, right? And we say, God, am I really like that? Yes. Yeah, you are a sinner in need of grace, always, right? But luckily, God gives us that to us freely. And he says, save yourselves. Be on the lookout. Verse 41, this is where we'll close it. So those who received his words were baptized, and they were added that day, about 3,000 souls. Um, so just, just a reminder, if you look at Colossians, um, it's a place I love to go a lot of times. In, in 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts. So this needs to be the attitude moving forward. And then moving into verse 41, he says, Those who received the word were baptized. So they received it. We know they had already repented. They received the Holy Spirit, and they were baptized. And about 3,000 souls were added that day. Have you ever seen anything like that? Um, I remember um, going to the uh, Billy Graham Crusades when he was still doing those things. And, uh, it, it was just kind of a sight to see. You know, you saw all those people filling the old Cowboys Stadium, which now is flattened on the ground. And they've got a new just giant monument you can see from space. It's ridiculous if you go there and see it. Um, I'm just driving by all the time. I see that. I say, why, why would you build something like that? Why is there the need for that? And then I know we were driving by the... Um, Bill Stadium. I didn't even I didn't even know that was the Bill Stadium because I'm used to you know seeing that like skyscraper of an indoor complex. And here, you know, it's like a negative twenty windshield. And and so we were driving by and looked at Christy. I said, "That says Bills on. Is that where the Bills play?" Yeah, yeah, it is. I was like, "Wow. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, these fans must be serious because you watch the games and they're all you guys. You know, you, maybe you've been there before. They're all out and they're in the snow and like those guys are really. And you turn over to the Cowboys. It's like air conditioned. You know." Roof over the top, right? So the question is, I mean, are we really serious about these things? Do we really believe? So just so you know, I did call everybody diehard fans, Bills fans in here. Um, kind of wimps in Texas, I guess. And so <laughs> verse 41, um, he sees that you see 3,000 people that make a decision, and it's not just, you see 3,000, but um, in kind of that, that Greek New Testament world, um, they really only counted the guys. So when, when people made a decision, a family made a decision, the male made a decision, the husband, um, the whole family would follow suit, right? Because when the husband's heart's changed, the whole family's is, right? And that's the way that God set it up from the beginning. And so this whole family is grafted in the community of faith. So 3,000 men, you think, well, okay, we got a wife also, you got kids, and they had a lot of kids back then too, so uh, not like it is now. And so you're thinking, like, maybe there's like fifteen or 20,000 people easily that made it in that day to follow Jesus. And I that is awesome. And, and I, I go back to the conversation that um, I had with uh, Mike and Lauren uh, over at our house with Gia and um, just her desire uh, to be baptized and to do that as soon as she could. And Mike, you know, you as the, the husband and father saying, well, we got a creek. Can we do it tomorrow? Um, I was a little caught off guard by that, I think. Cause I was like, oh, wow, uh, <laughs> tomorrow. But the truth is that the response of the people in the New Testament was simply this. 
they repented and they believed, they received the Holy Spirit, and they said, what, what's next? What do we do? Well, be baptized, right? And that's what happened. And so um, I think just moving forward, we've got a lot of exciting things I think are going to happen for our church and things that are even in the works you know, with our deacons and trustees and, and maybe seeing those type of things take place in a, in a baptistry or something like that here in our sanctuary. And I make no promises because our leaders you know, uh, will decide that. But um, I just want you to know we're praying through those kind of things and saying how can we uh, best represent what God is doing in this church here. And I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. And uh, I just want to close with a story. Um, it's about a young man. Uh, I've gotten to interact with just probably thousands of teenagers over the 10 years that Christy and I were doing student ministry in Texas. And a couple years ago, I had a young man. I say young man, but he was like six foot five, uh, 225. He's uh, probably going to be playing football for the NFL sometime soon. Uh, and I'm looking up at him, and he comes to me after we shared the gospel at one of our kind of outreach-centered uh, services for middle school students in our gym. Uh, and he says, Pastor, I want to, I mean, I want to be saved, but, uh, you know, my family... They've done a lot of bad things, and, uh, and you know, me too. I, uh, I, I, I could tell you those things, and, um, and he began to, and I said, that's okay, you don't have to keep going. Uh, he said, you know what, I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve to be saved. I know you, I see kids getting baptized here in the gym, and I just think, that's what I want. I said, you can have that. He says, well, well how? I said, it's easy. Here's what you do. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and... And he said, I can do that too? I said, yeah, you can do that too. And this six foot five, 225 pound teenage middle school boy started weeping there with me and put his faith and trust in Jesus. And so uh, I, I just want to share with you, I don't think that anybody's outside of the saving grace that God has given us. And just this reminder that as we think about what are the most important things to us, um, I would hope that it wouldn't take a, uh, an earth shattering event, but a lot of times it does. Uh, for us to really understand what is the most important thing to us. And the truth is that the most important thing to all of us should be God himself, that he's given us a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, and we get to walk with him, experience life together. Yes, walk through the difficulty get it together. But here's the truth that we get to share as we walk through that with everybody else that's around us. It's available to you too. It's available to everybody. So... Uh, just want to encourage you um, as we as we share these things and we work together. Uh, I just want to challenge you as you're sharing with people that are in your circles. Um, you know what? This is not a perfect place, and it never will be um, until Jesus comes back and He rescues His bride, this church, uh, everybody, and He takes us back to Himself and He makes all things right. And so, um, with that being the mindset, sharing with those um, that are around you, here's what we're about. We want to follow Jesus. We want to do the best job that we can. We want to honor Him. Uh, knowing we're going to make mistakes along the way. Uh, we just like to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, maybe just a missional mindset, that's what I would call it, um, and sharing with those who are around you, maybe not even a, hey, if you don't trust in Jesus right now, uh, then there's no hope for you. Uh, maybe just the truth that that is the case, but also, why don't you just give church a chance? Why don't you come and see what it's about? Uh, just an encouragement, maybe to change what people have done in the past, the preconceived ideas, okay? Um, if you're here today and you've never made a decision, just want to uh, give you that opportunity. Uh, I'll be here after the service. I uh, would love to talk to you about that, how you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and how all the wonderful things after that take place, the receiving of the Holy Spirit and getting to be baptized, um, hopefully here in our church sometime soon. And so let me pray for you, and then we'll close. Uh, Father, we come before you today. Um, God, your uh, word is the most important thing to us to read. God, who you are and what you've done uh, through your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross is the most important to us. God, you are the most important person in our lives. Um, God, I pray that we would have that mindset that maybe that would change uh, our relationships with our spouse, with our kids, uh, with our families, with our friends, with our coworkers. Um, God, we know when we put you first, not everything is perfect. We make mistakes all the time. Uh, but, God, we're so thankful that you wrap us up in your grace. Um, God, that that demand for holiness that we saw in the Old Testament as we're reading through the quiet times in Genesis, that there had to be a holy answer, that you don't just allow sin to go on, but yet, God, you answered our sin in Jesus Christ. Uh, God, we're so thankful we get to look back and take uh, just really a hopeful approach towards the future in our lives that we are covered by your grace. God, we know we don't deserve it. We pray that this same message of what is 
uh, would be able to go out um, to those that we love and we care about, um, the people we are. God, I pray that we would share that um, every chance we get, that we are not only in need of what you've done for us, that everybody around us is in need of that hope, and it's free, and you ask nothing for it. You just say, just trust in me. God, we, uh, we thank you for that truth. We thank you you've given that grace uh, available to all of us who choose to put our faith and trust in you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. I uh, love you guys. Have a good Sunday. And uh, go Bills, right? I think they're playing today. Okay.